Well, Christmas is over for another year. And if you are anything like what happened in our households, you got stuff. Perhaps a lot of stuff. And what do we do? We take that stuff and we've got stuff to go in the closet. Right? You've got closet stuff. And then there's stuff that goes in the rec room. Whether it sits on the floor or you hang it up. There's stuff that go in the kitchen cupboards. There's stuff that we have that go in the garage. We got stuff. Lots of stuff. The question is, what does God think about all the stuff that we have? Now, that seems a little bit unsettling because we don't like to think that God is interested in our stuff. Here's, here's how our rationale goes. We think to ourselves, God, you worry about the salvation, you worry about heaven, you worry about all the things that happen in the universe, but we can handle the situation here on earth. Okay. In fact, we think that we're doing God a favor. We've got everything under control here, and we are led to believe that God is not interested in what happens in our lives, what happens on earth. We are led to believe that what is ours and what we have worked for belongs to us and he has no rights to interfere or suggest or command that we do anything that we don't want to with our stuff. And so what we do is we separate God from us. God, you do with all the stuff that things that we, we can't control. You, you control the weather, you prepare heaven for us. We're, we're happy with that. But we've got things on earth. We've got that covered. We're good down here. Uh, so the question is, how is that working for us? One of the things I would suggest that if maybe we were a little bit more interested in what God said to us about things on earth, we wouldn't be in such a state of mess we are. Let me give you an example. If we were interested in what God says about our finances, many of us wouldn't find ourselves filing for bankruptcy. We wouldn't find ourselves in such debt that we are. But no, we have this imagination that somehow God is just leaving us and, and we can sort things out for ourselves. If we had explored what God says about relationships and marriage in his word, maybe our marriages would be a lot stronger than they are. If we had been interested in, in God's thought on raising children, maybe they wouldn't be as rebellious as they are. Maybe if we had consulted God about things that go on here on earth, we would be a lot better off than we are. And I'm convinced it's a lie that we separate God from our everyday activities. You see, we have become so obsessed with our stuff far too long. God, you've got no right to tell me what I should do with my stuff, what I should do with my time, what I should do with my money. You leave that alone. But God says, look, if you trust me, great things are going to happen. And we're going to look at what he has outlined in his word about stuff. Let's pray. Father, again, would you open our eyes, clear our minds, Convict our hearts that we may understand how you care about us in the most detailed parts of our lives. May you help us to readjust our focus. In Jesus' name, amen. With uh, January comes potentially 
time to consider what we're going to do with our taxes. And part of that may include a meeting with your financial advisor. Uh, sometimes we hear of, of people who uh, dabble in the stock, stock market, and, and they have, uh, once in a while, we, they have made lots of money in the stock markets because they have what they call insider information. That means they either have a, a connection that tells them when, when to sell their stocks or when to buy new stocks. And so this inside information helps them become rich, helps them acquire things. God has given us his word, and with that he's given us inside information. He becomes our financial planner. When we get together with financial planners, and I'm using that word collectively, not, not individual. When we get together with our financial planners, we sit down and, and we look at... Where can we invest our money to bring, bring greater returns? Can I get 4% here and 2% there? Or what's the best? So we plan and calculate it out. God's got it all planned out for us. The problem is, number one, we don't believe it. And number two, we think we can handle it ourselves. Now, there are some people who will say, well... I just want to serve God. I don't really care about what happens. I just want to serve God. Isn't that so nice? But you know what? God is interested in how we serve him. In fact, 1 John chapter 2 says this. And now little children abide in him. That when he appears we will have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming. You see, God wants us to succeed, not only here, but he's got greater plans beyond this. In fact, God wants us to be motivated. Parents often use rewards to motivate their children to accomplish great things. And so should it surprise us that God uses rewards? But we come so politely, oh, I don't want a reward from God. I don't know about you, but I want rewards. In Revelation chapter 5, it talks about the 24 elders sitting around the throne. And at a given signal, they take off their crowns and cast it towards the feet of Jesus. And I'm wondering, and I don't know, but I'm wondering if I were in that crowd, and, and maybe there's a crowd of millions and, and billions of people around the throne. And I'm wondering if at the given signal, I reached up to, find, to, to, to throw my crown at the feet of Jesus, the one who saved me, and I find I've got nothing to offer him. How ashamed, how embarrassing that would be. So God gives us four tests to look at, and we're going to look at at least one today, this morning, and maybe the rest tonight. Four things. To evaluate the stuff that we have. And it starts off, test number one is the durability test. The durability test. And there's a question with, with each test. And here's the question. How long will it last? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break through and steal. This is a negative command. Don't do it. Don't do it. Do not lay up for yourself. Notice that word yourselves. When we do things for ourselves, we think that we're greedy. Don't do it for yourselves. I remember maybe 25 years ago, a man came to our house and he wanted to sell us life insurance. And his plan was pretty attractive. By the time that I reached such and such an age, I would have so much money saved up. And he started presenting me with all of these things that I could do with this $1.5 million that had accumulated 
And all of these things he presented were things for myself. I could enjoy life. I could take a trip. I could buy a boat. I could do things that I haven't dreamed of doing. All for myself. He says, you want a little bit of financial advice? You want a little bit of of inside information? He says, don't lay up for yourself. Notice it says, treasures on earth. The question really becomes is, where are you doing your banking? Because you can't have your accounts in two different banks. Treasures is the thing that attracts us. It not only includes money, but includes our possessions. Why, don't, why, why not save up for ourselves treasures? Now? Because there's moth and rust. I remember my parents were missionaries uh, one time, and I remember we used to get uh, missionary barrels. And, and when the, the clothes came in, you know, they, they would take the lid off, and all of, of the top were mothballs. You know how they smell? Why? To keep the moths off so the moths wouldn't eat away at the clothing. And now we live outside of town, and we have all sorts of cute little field mice. And we have traps over there. Why? So, so that the field mice wouldn't come in and, and make their nest and, and eat all the things that we have there. Remember when vehicles were made out of real metal? 1941, I think. And, and you, would, you would look at the stuff, or your, your vehicle, and you would say to, to your neighbor or to someone else, Boy, Russ is really eaten away at that, that vehicle. And you would see all the ro- rows of, of brown stuff, and it would all flake off. Why? Because rust ate it. The idea of rust is the eating of something. I, while my parents weren't farmers, we lived in a farming community, and every once in a while, one of my buddies would go down to the silo with a pellet gun. And he would shoot the rats that were in the silos that were eating the grain and destroying the value of the grain. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Notice something else. Thieves break through and steal. And the idea of of breaking through is, is digging and and usually back then, uh, the walls were made of, of mud or some sort of mud material, and it would not be unusual for a thief to dig through the wall. That's why in, in Matthew chapter uh, 13, we have, uh, uh, I think it's verse 44, uh, a man who, who went out into the field and, and dug a hole and hid his valuables. Why? So it wouldn't be stolen. How long will it last? But not only that, treasures are not only tangible. Our stuff is not only stuff that we can see, but it's also other things, things that our heart gravitates to. How about we can love a position? Maybe you're the president of a company, or you've just been promoted, and now you have within your power uh, an opportunity to hire or fire people at your will. Maybe you're a business administrator for a a, a company. Now you can spend thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars without ever being questioned. There's power in that. That becomes your treasure. Now, while verse 19 is a negative command, verse 20 is a positive command. It says, but lay up for who? Yourselves. Isn't that greedy? Well, apparently God didn't think so. The question I'm going to ask again, where are you banking? If you want to lay up for yourselves treasures on earth and and get all the enjoyment and, and, and things like that, and they do provide some enjoyment, you can do that. But Jesus comes along and says, I've got a better solution for you. Lay for yourselves treasures on in heaven. That means that, that I can get treasures in heaven. God's got something for me. 
Jesus didn't specifically say lay for yourselves, lay not up for yourselves money. Money is only part of our situation. Because not everybody has money, but I'm convinced everybody has something they treasure. What do you treasure? What would happen if this morning while we were here that you went home and, and you found that your house had burnt down? What would you miss most about the stuff that you have? The command in verse 19 is in the Greek what we call a present tense verb, and that means it's continuing to happen. In other words, if we could translate it, he would say, stop laying up for yourselves. You've been laying this, the, all these things up for yourselves, but don't lay them up for yourselves anymore. Lay them up because there's a bank in heaven. And I guarantee you the bank in heaven will pay more interest and have greater benefits than the TD or Scotiabank or Royal Bank or Canada Trust or whatever banking system you use now. The story is told of a man who knew Christ as a savior, but he, God had blessed him and he had a lot of stuff. But not only did he had a lot of stuff, he, he, he had employees that he was not very generous with, and, and he would never uh, help out those people who were in need. And, and when the needy came to, to look for his help, he would send them to other people, and, and he, was, he was kind of stingy with his money and his stuff. But he died. And uh, he met St. Peter outside the pearly gates, and, why does St. Peter always get stuck at the pearly gates? You ever wonder that? I mean, can't, don't they have a rotational basis or something? Doesn't Thomas ever get it? Anyway, he met St. Peter, and, and Peter says, come, and, and I'll, I'll show you the celestial city. I think this is a made-up story anyway. And, and, and so they, they were walking through the, the, the celestial city, and, and he was amazed at all these great big mansions and places where these people were and they walked down the street and he came and he, he says whose place is that and and saint peter says that's your chauffeur's place oh wow that's pretty neat that's amazing yeah he says your chauffeur was a, also a man of god and and and, and uh he was he was giving and and kind and then he walks down a little, the, the road a little bit farther and he comes across another huge mansion. Whose place is that? Oh, that, that's, that's, your, that's your, uh, your maid's place. Oh, that's humongous. That's wonderful. This is good. And, and so they come, come walking down a little farther and, and he looks and he says, he, he sees a place in the distance. And as they got closer, he said to St. Peter, he says, oh, man. Look at that place. It's got tar paper on. It's got two by four on. It's not very finished. It's not manicured very well. He says, Who's poor? What, what poor souls gets this place? And he says, It's yours. He says, What do you mean it's mine? He's, he said, uh, St. Peter said to him, He says, This is all we could do with what you sent ahead. The point is this send it ahead, don't keep it now. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because treasures will decay. The moth will get it. The mice will get it. Something will ruin it. Don't you just love those people? And I'm sorry if, if this comes down and you can relate to this. I, I uh, worked for a fellow. His name was Johnny. He bought a brand new Honda car. This is, oh, 20 years ago. And he parked it at the end of the parking lot. He took up two parking spaces. You know those kind of people? Why? He didn't want anybody scratching. And there was a temptation. I just said a temptation, okay? Okay, just said it. To go down there and, oh, it's just stuff. But I didn't. What has our hearts? And we find out the result is decay. We find out that not only decays, it disappears. 
The Bible says the moth will find it, the dust, the rust will destroy it, the thieves will steal it. Jesus could have gone on and said the fire will consume it, the government takes it away, the floods wash it out, the smoke causes smoke damage. All the things. Why is it we, in our society, hold so desperately two-fisted on things that will eventually disappear? Because no earthly treasure that we have is safe. No banking that we have, no banking system is foolproof. What would happen tomorrow if you found out that somehow the banking institute that you had had been hacked and all your money was gone? What happens now if you find out that, that, that the things that you had depended on is no longer available? What happens now if you find out the plans that you had for your retirement and, and going here and doing this now has changed because your mom or your dad or even one of your children now need your constant attention? You see, the bottom line is stop putting away things on earth. Stop saving things. Stop hoarding things. Things are tools to use to minister to other people. Our money are tools to, to minister. And what we do is we, we invest them in people because people are the only things that, that have eternity. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That's where we lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven. When we take the things that God has given us and use them to meet other people's needs, use them to challenge other people, to build for eternity. But no, we're so concerned about Getting the stuff here now. Well, you can, but you can't have it both ways. Occasionally, you will hear of a person who has been robbed from their home, and it, it usually is a senior citizen, a senior person. And the story might go like this. The senior has been robbed by thieves who have come in and, and, and the senior was robbed because they kept all of their money in their mattress. They didn't trust the banks. And you know what we do? We shake our heads and say, oh, what foolishness. Let me ask you a question. Is that any different than what we do? Their whole life savings gone because thieves came in and took their mattress. And who knows how many thousands of dollars because they laid up for themselves in their mattresses. Because they didn't trust the banks. But no, we do the same kind of things, don't we, in our lives. Now, please, don't misunderstand. I don't know where this, how this galvanizes or crystallizes in your heart. God is not against having stuff. God is against stuff becoming our priority in life. And so what happens to our stuff? We go to a lot of trouble fixing up our house, buying the car, having our stamp collection, having all sorts of stuff, having our 16-inch HD, AD, AD? Or does television come to AD? Maybe it does. I don't, uh, television down there, all stuff. God says, here, I've got a better plan. You want to send stuff ahead. You want to send people ahead. When you get to heaven, if we can use that illustration, you want to make sure that you sent enough ahead that you get rewards. God rewards people. God is not a, a, a tightwad who, who doesn't enjoy. He loves giving out rewards. And so we spend our time with our investment finance portfolio and we spend time trying to figure out how we can utilize that to get the more, most money. And We buy our new truck or new car and we have our, our motor home and we have our boat and we have our uh, 
ATV and we have all sorts of gadgets. God says, I'll give you some inside information. You want rewards in heaven? I'll tell you how to get it. Send things ahead. The second test we'll deal with tonight. The heart test. And I'm just going to read to you the verse and then we'll close. The heart test in verse 21 says this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as you go home this morning and perhaps get a chance uh, quietly this afternoon, ask yourself, where's your heart? We've seen that the stuff that we get now is, is tangible, it's breakable. Maybe some of your Christmas gifts have broken already. <laughs> they break faster than your resolutions. I don't know. Maybe some of them have limited value. But I think for the new year, we need to examine our hearts. God, what would be and what would be the best investment of my life if I want to get rewards in heaven? This fellow who was telling us how we could invest so much money a month to get so much money at the end of so many years, sounded pretty tempting. The thing is, I said to him after, and he, he, he professed to know Christ as a Savior, and I suspect that he did. I said to him, I said, you know, this is interesting. He says, I, I said to him, you've presented all these things for me, for me, for me, for me, on the assumption that I'm not happy. I said, I have, there's a couple of problems I have with this. And I started quoting him some Bible verses, and he didn't like that that much. I don't know why. I was really nice. I said, you know, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 says this, Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Philippians 4.19 says this, My God shall supply all your needs. So then he asked me an interesting question. It was a guilt-motivated question. Because my wife was there, and I, I think we might have had three or four children. He says, what happens if something happens to, to your family, and, and you don't have this investment? And you know what I said? I said, I had not an idea. I have no clue what happens. No idea at all. But I do know this. God has a better plan. What happens if you die? I said, I don't know. I'm dead. I'm gone. That's their problem and God's problem. They can work it out between the two of them. Well, don't you think that God has given us a, a, a mind to, to figure these things out? I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer that. No, I don't. And I'll tell you why. In my Bible reading, I have never come across a passage that says, I have the ability to figure out my life here. But I've come across an interesting verse, and it may be one you know. It says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you know what the next phrase there says? And lean not what? On your own understanding. Why? Why not lean on our own understanding? Because my understanding is limited. Because my understanding is flawed. Because my understanding is self-serving. And so when I go to make it a, a decision, here's what we need to do. When it's a financial decision, God, I need your help. James chapter 1, verse 5. If a man lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask of God who gives to all men liberally. Not all men who are liberals. All men liberally. And it shall be what? Given him. So when I'm going into, uh, to, to, to a business venture, I said, God, look, I, I've got this proposal. Somebody wants me to invest this amount of money. I don't know what to do. Can you please give me wisdom? 
God, I've got this relationship, and, and I don't know if they're the right one for me. Can you please give me wisdom? God, I've got this rebellious child, and I don't know what to do. Can you please give me wisdom? And perhaps one of the reasons we have ourselves in so much moral and financial and ethical problems is because we have left God out of the picture. And as we look to 2016, I don't know what it's going to hold for myself or for even for you. But maybe God wants to draw us to to the point that maybe we need to loosen our grip just a little bit on the things that he's given us. And start looking at ways we can start to send things ahead. Let's pray. Father, we would ask that you would take these words and perhaps they have challenged in people's hearts this morning. I don't know how this all shakes down. I don't know the situation of people, the things that they're struggling with. But may... 2016 be a start of us taking our role and our responsibility and our stuff to send it ahead so that one day we could stand before you and we would have something to show for all the things that you have given us here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.